Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest Sporties webinar. We're glad you could join us today for Data Link Weather, where we'll be talking about how to use ADSB and SiriusXM Data Link Weather for safer and more comfortable flying. We're glad we could have you with us today for this webinar. We're going to cover a lot of ground here in the next hour. My name is John Zimmerman. I'm your host today. I am the president of Sporties, which you see right there on the screen on the runway at the Claremont County Airport. Get to fly a variety of different aircraft, get to use data link weather almost daily when I'm flying. Uh, everything from tail draggers to high performance turboprops. Uh, I'm also the editor at Airfax. That's a free online magazine we do at Sporties. And uh, that's a great place to deepen your weather knowledge. We have a series there we call Go or No Go, where we do uh, scenario on basic weather uh, forecasts and what you would do based on the current forecast and your qualifications. So great place to test out your weather skills. Give you a quick overview of what we're gonna cover today. As I said, we're gonna cover a lot of ground today. And I wanna start with the fundamentals, which is some basic rules for weather flying. This is the overview of how to approach weather flying. Before we dive into all the details of the latest technology, I think it's important to have uh, a, a guiding sense of how to use weather and what you're looking for. So we're gonna talk about those rules. We will then get into some details of ADS-B versus Sirius XM. These are the two most popular ways to get weather in the cockpit. We'll talk about the differences and frankly, the similarities between these two uh, and how to use them. Then we'll talk about avoiding the main uh, risks when it comes to weather. You know, What do we mean by staying safe from weather in flight? We'll, we'll talk about what we actually care about and, uh, and what we're looking at. And then probably the most fun part for me, we'll talk about some real world scenarios where we put all this theory into action and I'll show you some screenshots and pictures from flights I have made over the years with data link weather and what I learned from them. So that sort of brings it all together, hopefully gives you some application. You can go out and fly with these tools. All right, I like to start at the overview of why this matters because it's easy to talk about the technology and the features, uh, but you may ask yourself, do I care? Uh, is this all just academic knowledge or is this all just the, the, you know, the love of the next gadget? I think it does matter. I think it matters a lot because the smart use of weather technology can improve safety. These are not just gadgets. These are absolutely safety tools when they are used properly. And I think there's some evidence for this. So if you look at the AOPA Air Safety Institute's NAL report, kind of the gold standard of uh, general aviation accident reporting every year, they look back and over the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, this is looking at 2020 data, the most recent we have, overall accidents are down 25%, which is great. Uh, this is for non-commercial fixed wings. So the type of flying most of us are probably doing. Down 25% is great, but if you look at weather accidents, they are down 57%, which is really a staggering number. Now, you can uh, see that ADSB weather was introduced really in 2011. It's been around longer than that, but that's when it became popular. That's when portable receivers really came on the market in huge numbers. That's when these receivers started showing up in a lot of airplanes. Now, that's a correlation. I'm not drawing a direct line from ADSB weather to a decline in weather accidents, but I think it's certainly suggestive. For a slightly more rigorous study, AOPA did a study a few years back looking at ADSB in equipped airplanes, that is airplanes that can receive ADSB traffic and weather. And they found uh, pretty compelling evidence that ADSB in really does improve safety. 53% lower accident rate overall, and an 88% lower fatal accident rate, which to me is a really staggering number. 88% uh, decline in fatal accidents something's going on there. Uh, something very interesting, I think, is going on there. And it sure seems like ADSB in is related to it. So that to me suggests there is a great benefit to flying with data link weather, uh, not just pretty pictures to look at on the iPad screen, but real safety improvements. So that, that, that to me is exciting. However, the important footnote to this is that it's a self-service world now. If you've been flying a long time, you'll know this, but you know, the days of walking into a flight service station and talking to a briefer in person are long gone. The days of calling up FlightWatch in flight are basically gone. Uh, you know, There's more weather information than ever, but it's up to us to find it and interpret it and use it wisely. So it's a double-edged sword. We, we have the tools now. We have more information than we could have dreamed of 25 years ago, but it's on us to know how to use it. 
And that's really what this webinar is all about, understanding what's out there, what are the tools that are available, but then really being able to put that to use the right way so that in this self-service world, we're using it properly. So with that in mind, let's get a little bit of a framework around how to think about these tools. And these are the five weather rules I use. These are my rules. These are not out of the FAA textbook. I'm sure you could probably add three or four more yourself. This is also not the end all be all of weather knowledge you have to know. But I think these are five important rules anytime we talk about data link weather. And we're gonna walk through each one of these in turn. First of all, probably the most important and probably the most overlooked is to always get the big picture first. A lot of people dive right into the radar and the METAR and is there any red on the map and what's the ceiling? And that's important and we'll get to that, but I think it's important to start with the big picture. In other words, have a theory and then fit data to that. Or as some people uh, have joked with me, don't operate without a diagnosis. And that's really what we're trying to do here. Understand what are the underlying conditions. So with weather, that means look at the lows, look at the fronts. These are the things that drive weather patterns. If there's a strong low moving into your area and it has a fast moving cold front uh, dangling down from this low, that's a weather maker. That might mean totally unflyable weather, it might mean flyable weather, but still something you wanna know about. So look for those main drivers of weather. Look at that surface analysis chart like you see here. Try to get a general sense of what's happening. Then I like to look at the upper air analysis charts. There are lots of different ways to find this, but generally the 500 millibar analysis is the best. This is about uh, 18,000 feet. And this is a great way to get a sense of those steering currents. This is basically, What's driving the upper level weather? Are there any big lows aloft? Are they cut off where they're not even circulating? They're not moving, they're just sort of swirling. Uh, you can see the lines on the map here where we have sort of a, a ridge off the west coast and then we've got a, a trough there underneath the blue, kind of the air comes swinging down from Canada. Uh, those are the highways for weather. So you don't have to understand every part of that chart and what they're saying, but I think it's helpful to have a general sense of what is a larger weather pattern here that I need to be aware of, because this will influence the more tactical decisions we make as we look at products like radar and METARs. All right, rule number two is to remember the data link delay. Something that if you've been around data link weather for a while has probably been drilled into you. Uh, and this is in both important, but also a little bit overrated. So the important part is that data link weather is delayed. It's not real time. The only real time weather product is your eye, maybe onboard radar, you could argue, but all data link weather inherently is delayed. It takes time for that ground-based radar to sweep the sky, for the software to clean up that data picture, to transmit it up to your device, to send it over to your iPad and to display it on a screen. So you're not looking at real-time weather. Total latency, it's usually around five to seven minutes, but can easily be 10 or even 15 minutes in some cases. So that is not real time. It is important to make that timestamp a part of your regular in-flight scan though, because if you see 30 or 40 minutes delay, something's gone wrong. So you can see we have circled here for flight with the timestamp in the top left corner of the maps page. Every device you look at, whether it's panel mount or an iPad app is gonna have a timestamp. Uh, just make that a part of your regular scan. You're looking at oil pressure, altitude, uh, RPM, check that timestamp, make sure you're continuing to get up-to-date weather data. One other point though that I think is worth noting is that there is a difference between the transmission time and the time the weather product is updated. In other words, METARs are generally only updated on the hour. So you can be getting data link weather every five minutes, but you're not gonna get a fresh METAR every five minutes. The picture you see on the screen here is Garmin Pilot. And I think they do a nice job of displaying what you're looking at. On the left side there, you see the data source, it's FISB, which is what ADSB is, and it's 23 minutes old. It tells you when it was observed. So there's a difference between that observation time and when the data was transmitted. Some people occasionally look at this and say, my METAR is 45 minutes old. I'm not getting updated data link weather. That's not true necessarily. It just means there hasn't been a new METAR issued. Now, many products like radar, for example, is updated every five minutes or so. So you should always be seeing that updated, but that's not true of every weather product. Number three, this one really follows rule number two. If, if data link weather is 
uh, not real time, then that means that data link is to be used for strategic weather avoidance, not tactical avoidance. That means you have to make a plan to avoid the weather long before you get there. Data link weather is not something you do where you fly up to it like you see here on the left and we're gonna pick our way through these embedded thunderstorms and we're gonna quote unquote find the soft spot. That is not what data link weather is for. Data link weather is to see that line of nasty stuff up ahead and fly well around it, visually navigating around it. You can see on the right, this is really what I like to do. If there's a nasty uh, line of stuff up ahead, we're not even gonna get close to it. We're not gonna fly up to it and try to pick our way through it. We're gonna take our course line and foreflight in this case and just drag it until it's well clear. I'm gonna change my flight plan with air traffic control and I'm gonna deviate well around it. That's a lot easier than asking ATC for 10 degrees right, 20 degrees left. I can just miss the whole thing. Uh, now, every single garden variety summer pop-up, maybe not, but if there's definitely uh, some significant weather out there, the point is we wanna avoid it by many, many miles, not use data link weather for tactical deviations, picking around embedded cells. So that's a recipe for disaster. We've talked a lot about radar. We will continue to talk a lot about uh, radar as the day goes on, but it's worth pointing out rule number four, you should do more than just look at the radar. Radar is very, very helpful, but there's a lot of products that are available through either ADSB or Sirius XM weather. In fact, more and more over the years have been added. METARs, pilot reports, cloud tops, lightning, some new ADSB products over the last few years include cloud tops, turbulence forecast, lightning, Sirius XM has even more products, which we'll talk about. So go beyond just the basics of radar and METARs. There is much more to data link weather than just that. Uh, and you wanna really get a complete picture of the air you're flying in. Okay, there's some thunderstorms possibly out there. What do the METARs say? What do the pilot reports say? Is there lightning? All of these things come into play to really get a, a full diagnosis of what you're dealing with. Number five, and probably most important, would be the eyes always win. So as much as we're gonna talk about all the data link weather tools that are out there and how great they are and the apps and the panel avionics, all of those are simply used to support the decision you make. The person in the left seat is the pilot in command. You make the decisions and all the pretty screens can only help support that decision. They cannot make that decision for you. And when in doubt, if it looks bad, don't fly through it, no matter what the screen says. Here's a great example, uh, a picture taken on a flight from a few years back of a pretty nasty looking cloud out to the right. My question is always to pilots, I'm not even gonna show you the data link weather view. I'm not gonna show you my iPad. Would you fly through that? Do you need to know anything more to make a decision? Obviously not, that's a nasty looking cell. That has got convection, that has got wind shear, probably hail, that's ugly. You wouldn't fly through that in a Boeing. So. Don't let a lack of radar returns or pilot reports talk you into flying through that. If it looks ugly, don't do it. Seems obvious, but there can be some pressure sometimes in flight where you can talk yourselves into making a bad decision. Just remember that the eyes always win and the pilot in command is the one making the decision, not an app or a panel in the, in the uh, screen in the panel. All right, so that's the structure. That's maybe the philosophy of how to use data link weather. As I said, I think that's important, often overlooked. We're gonna apply that now uh, and to, in terms of how we actually get weather data in the cockpit. And that really means Sirius XM versus ADSB. These are the two most common ways, really the only practical way, unless you have in-flight Wi-Fi, which is quite rare and expensive, uh, to get data link weather in the cockpit. So uh, I will start out by saying both of these are excellent systems. Uh, you, you can debate the finer points, but both of these are really great. They're useful. I fly with both. The similarities are more important than the differences. However, if you're evaluating uh, some new avionics or you want to understand what you have right now, it's worth talking about a few of the differences. So very quickly, ADSB, as most of you probably know by now, is a ground-based system. It is, runs off of a network of uh, ground-based transmitters built by the FAA. And so it's line of sight reception. This is, I will say, like VORs. Uh, if Sirius XM is like GPS, ADSB is like VORs. Ground-based, which means it's line of sight reception, which means higher is better. Uh, you're not gonna get ADSB on the ground in most places. And uh, low altitude out west, you probably won't get it until you get further up to cruise altitude. This map shows coverage at about 1,500 feet AGL. 
So you can see at about pattern altitude, most places east of the Mississippi, you have ADSB reception, and most places up and down the West Coast. But if you're over uh, the Dakotas, Montana, Idaho, and you're down low, there's a lot of terrain out there, obviously. There are not quite as many stations. You might not have reception. The good news is that by 5,000 feet, maybe a tip using altitude for most cross countries, you've got uh, data link weather reception from ADSB basically across the entire United States, uh, a lot of parts of Alaska, even Puerto Rico uh, as well. The other great part about ADSB is it's subscription free. I won't say it's free because your tax is paid for it, but there's no monthly fee. You just have to have a receiver and an app or a panel screen to display it. So that is certainly a great, great benefit. What do you get with ADSB? Uh, basically, all the things you would want. It includes radar, airmets, sigmets, METARs, NOTAMs, PIREPs, TAFs, winds and temps aloft. It's worth noting that different weather products are transmitted at different update rates. The most important one you see there is the regional versus CONUS radar. So radar is not transmitted in just one giant picture of the entire US. It's broken down. You'll have that regional NEXRAD composite image within about 150, 250 miles of your airplane. And that is a higher resolution product updated every two and a half minutes. Then beyond that, the CONUS or Continental US NEXRAD composite is the entire US and that's updated every 15 minutes and it's lower resolution. So maybe you just took off in your airplane and you get a radar update and you only see weather within about 200 miles of your airplane. That's okay, as you fly along in a few minutes, you should see the rest of that radar come in. Another detail with this is that there are different types of ADSB ground stations. Again, this is like VORs. There's low altitude, medium altitude, high altitude uh, stations. This really doesn't matter for day-to-day -day flying, so I wouldn't get hung up on this, but it's if you want to go kind of a layer down and really understand the system, this is what's happening out there. In typical operations, you're going to connect to four, five, six, eight, even 10, 12 stations if you're up high. So you're probably going to be receiving at least one of all of these. The only time this matters is if you're on the ground and you're only receiving a surface station or if you're at low altitude, uh, you may only be getting one station and you can see there are slightly different weather products and slightly different ranges transmitted depending on the type of ground station. So if you're on the ground and uh, maybe you see only you know, 100 miles of METARs and you only see regional next red, that's because you're only getting a surface station. As soon as you take off, you should probably get one of those medium or high altitude stations and the rest of the weather will fill in. So that's ADSB. Let's talk about Sirius XM. As I mentioned, this is more like the GPS example. This is satellite based. So it's beamed down from satellites in space. That means it works at all altitudes, even on the ground. So you can be in the run-up pad and be getting Sirius XM weather. You also get some coverage into Southern Canada and the Northern Caribbean. So this is the more premium product where it works everywhere. The other side of the premium though, is that there is a subscription. So unlike uh, ADSB, which is subscription free, there is a monthly subscription with SiriusXM, anywhere from $30 to $100 a month, depending on the products you want. Uh, I will say the $30 a month is enough if you're really just looking for the basics of METARs, TAFs, radar. Uh, the other nice thing with SiriusXM that a lot of pilots don't know is you can suspend your subscription for up to six months. So maybe you're really only flying in the summertime and the airplane kind of goes away for the winter. You can suspend a subscription, so you're only uh, paying for this when you need it. One of the things you get with SiriusXM for that subscription, in addition to the uh, coverage at any altitude, is additional weather products. So you get both base and composite radar, which we'll talk about in a second. You get storm cell tops and movement. Those are those orange arrows you see on the screen here. This is a Garmin pilot screen sh screenshot. And you can see that's showing you the altitude of uh, the echo tops there and the direction and speed of movement, which can be helpful for understanding how fast and how severe uh, a thunderstorm is. You also get satellite imagery, which you see on that screenshot there. That's the gray parts that's overlaid with the radar and a surface analysis map. None of those by themselves are absolute must haves, but all of those can be helpful in trying to diagnose what you're looking at. Real quick on base and composite reflectivity, this could be a whole nother weather geek webinar that we won't get into. Uh, some people call it lowest tilt. Basically base reflectivity is the lowest scan from a radar, whereas composite is combining all of the different scan angles. So if you think of a ground-based radar station out there, it's sweeping the sky. And what it's really doing is 
is sending out pulses of, of energy and listening for the return. And it does this at different scan elevations. So it'll do a scan, it'll tilt up, it'll scan, it'll tilt up, it'll scan. Base is taking that lowest tilt. You could think of it in really crude terms as what's coming out the bottom of the cloud. This is maybe what the meteorologist on TV cares about. Is rain hitting the pavement? Composite reflectivity looks at all those scan angles and says, where is the worst weather or the most reflectivity at all altitudes? So it's more of a worst case. Uh, there's value in both of these. I think in general for pilots, composite is what we want. Because we don't just drive on the roads, we fly in the sky, we do care about what's happening at all altitudes. And if it's really uh, significant precipitation uh, up high, we want to know about that. So uh, that's sort of that worst case scenario that I would fly with most often. That's what ADSB shows. However, if you really know what you're doing, you can compare base and composite and get a little better picture of exactly what's going on. Uh, you can see in this case, uh, the difference between base and composite showing composite looks worse. There's more yellow because again, that's taking the worst case from all altitudes. Whereas the base shows, maybe it's mostly rain, at least at the lower elevations. So again, not a must have, but a nice one to have and something you can get with Sirius XM. Comparing these two just briefly, uh, again, the, the basics are the same between them. You get METARs, TAFs, radars, py radar PIREPs, all the key things. Few important differences. One, again, Sirius XM is nationwide. Uh, you don't have some of the limitations of range. And then the radar is the single resolution nationwide, whereas the ADSB has two resolutions. So real quick on that topic, because it comes up sometimes, you hear that Sirius XM radar is higher resolution. That's not entirely true. Uh, really, regional ADSB radar and Sirius XM radar are about the same resolution. They look slightly different, have slightly different colors, but they're about the same resolution. The difference is Sirius XM is full resolution nationwide. So here we are in a trip out of Denver, uh, a thousand miles away from our destination, and you can see we have full resolution radar all over the US. There's no blockiness. We can see exactly what's going on. Here's an ADS-B screenshot where you can see closer to where we are, there's that higher resolution radar that looks a lot like Sirius XM. But as you get down south into Texas and Louisiana, you can see it's a lot blockier. That's that national or CONUS ADS-B radar picture. And as you get closer, that will come into that more uh, medium resolution regional radar. So as you get closer, you'll get that nicer picture, but it is blocky at longer distances. I will say in general, it's not a big deal. Uh, that stuff down there in Louisiana is pink and I don't need that in 4K resolution to know there's probably bad stuff down there. So that CONUS radar is still very helpful for long-term planning. But as you get closer and get that higher resolution picture, that'll help you make more specific uh, suggestions for a route change. One last piece on radar that I think often gets overlooked is uh, a lot of pilots understand you've got to be receiving data link weather, whether that's from an ADSB ground station or a Sirius XM satellite, but there also has to be data to send you. So it's not just enough to get the signal. Uh, that signal has to transmit something. And there are a few gaps in ground-based radar, so not many. We're pretty lucky in the US. We have lots and lots of radars. But you can see there are a few gaps. Uh, southeastern Oregon, uh, some parts of South Dakota, there's a few gaps in there. And, and you'll see this as a crosshatch on the screen. For, for example, in four flight, you turn on the radar layer, you'll see crosshatching. There's no radar there, no matter how much reception you're getting from Sirius XM or ADSB. That's just a limitation of the ground-based radar and how far out it can reach and how much overlap there is. Again, usually not a big deal, but if you find yourself in one of these places, just be aware there are a couple of gaps. All right, so that's the underlying technology between the two systems. Let's look briefly at how you can get hardware to actually receive them. Uh, you're, you're choosing between Sirius XM and ADSB, but what hardware do I actually need to receive those signals and then display them so I can do something with them? Uh, and so when we talk about hardware, we'll talk about panel mount avionics briefly here, and then we'll talk about portables, which are a very popular option. Panel mount, you really need uh, three different pieces. Well, you definitely need two and sometimes three. One, you need a receiver. You need a something to get that weather information. So if that's ADSB, popular option there is the Garmin GTX 345. That's an ADSB in and out transponder. So it both transmits out your position and receives in that weather. 
If you want Sirius XM, the most popular option there is the Garmin GDL69A. That's going to be an antenna that receives from the satellites. So that's how you get the data, but then you need a place to display it. So that's typically going to be your GPS or your glass cockpit. So a GTN 650-750 or on a glass cockpit like a G1000, G3X Touch. The picture you see here is a uh, G, G500 TXI panel. Um, and so that's a great way to fly. Now, the third piece there is if you want to send it over to an iPad or a tablet device, you'll need a wireless bridge. And the most popular option there is a Garmin Flightstream 210 or 510. Basically creates a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connection between your panel and your portable device. If you don't have the latest fancy avionics or if you want to back up a great option as a portable, there's more options there than ever. Uh, the newest and uh, top of the line is the Sentry Plus. This is from Foreflight. It's got a built-in screen, 18-hour battery life, so it's totally self-contained, totally wireless. Uh, in addition to the weather and traffic and GPS and all that stuff, also has a built-in flight data recorder, so it can be a little bit of a black box for debriefing your flights and logging your time. Also has a G meter. So that's sort of the, the latest and greatest. It's what I fly with a lot. That plus an iPad is a great all-in-one solution for situational awareness, but also a great backup. Some other options for ADSB hardware and a portable, Sentry Mini. This is the most affordable out there. It's $399 right now. This is a basic unit with no battery, no AHARs, so no backup attitude, but it's got weather, traffic, and GPS. Those are the essentials. You want to step up a little bit. The original Sentry is still a great value at $599. It adds a 12-hour battery life. It has that AHAR, so it'll give you a backup attitude, which you see on the screen here. And it's also got a carbon monoxide detector, which is a nice backup. So that's probably the best overall value. A lot of bang for the buck in that. Stratus 3 is a great option if you're flying with something other than ForeFlight because all three of those Sentry devices require ForeFlight. If you're using Flight Plan Go, Wing X, Garmin Pilot, FlyQ, uh, Stratus 3 is a great option. It works with about a dozen different apps and has the weather, traffic, GPS, AHARs options, those, those core four features. Or Garmin has their line of GDL receivers. Uh, GDL 50 is their ADSB receiver that works with their Garmin Pilot app, but also Flight Plan Go and ForeFlight. If you want Sirius XM in a portable, there's one option. That's the Garmin GDL 51, a lot like the 50, looks the same. Works with Garmin Pilot, uh, Garmin GPSs as well, also for Flight, Flight Plan Go. Uh, includes a GPS and an AHARS and an eight hour battery, and that's a good uh, affordable option for getting Sirius XM on your tablet. And then if you want everything, no compromises, the GDL 52 is both Sirius XM and ADSB. The reason you might want that is you could get Sirius XM weather, so you get all the weather details, but you also have that ADS-B receiver, and that gives you traffic alerts in flight. So uh, a lot of people like that option for the best weather, the best traffic, kind of no compromise. It is the most expensive of all the receivers, but uh, is, not as I said, all-in-one and a great option if you're using Garmin or ForeFlight. So if you're choosing among these, uh, there's lots of options. They're all really good. I would tell you on a portable start with the app, make sure that whatever device you're looking at works with your app because some of these are app specific, as I mentioned. And whichever app you like, whether it's ForeFlight or Garmin or Wing X or FlyQ, uh, you probably don't wanna change apps to go chase hardware. So make sure it's compatible with your app. Think about those extras. A lot of the differences between units depends on whether you care about flight data recording, CO detector, battery life. Uh, think about all those extras. And then also ease of use, support, uh, reliability, obviously, those matter. Here's a quick, I'll leave this slide up for a second. This is a pretty good side-by-side -side comparison of all those I just mentioned. You can see some of the core features, and they all do the, the basics. They all have GPS. Uh, they all have weather. All but the GDL51 have traffic as well. So they share those core features. As you see, it really gets down to uh, whether you want the, the AHARs, the battery life, and some of those add-ons. All right, so we've talked about the hardware, we've talked about the strategies for this. Let's actually talk about how to use these to stay safer. And I wanna focus on three uh, hazards, specifically IFR conditions, thunderstorms, and icing. Uh, I'm focusing on these three, not randomly, but because I think this, this is where we can have the most impact. So if you look at what causes weather accidents, again, this is from the AOPA Air Safety Institute, 
Uh, VFR into IMC, so uh, VFR pilots flying into instrument conditions and losing control is still uh, by far the main driver of accidents when it comes to weather accidents. Poor IFR technique, you could almost kind of group that under the same. That's really where it's an instrument flight, but uh, it's not done well. Thunderstorms and then icing. So if, if we were to magically wipe out all of those, you would cut weather accidents by 80%. Uh, that, that is what is driving most weather accidents. So that's why I'm focusing on these three. The good news is data link weather can help with all three of those. So let's look at each one of those. First up, IFR conditions. How do we use data link weather to avoid a VFR and IMC scenario? Well, this is a theme that will continue to come up, but weather rule number one, know the big picture. Uh, a lot of times with VFR and IMC, and, and I'll show you a scenario later that's a lot like this, you can fall into the trap of just looking at METARs and well, the, the METARs are, are green or, or at least blue, so it must be okay. You really gotta go a layer deeper than that. You really gotta understand the big picture. Uh, don't just read your destination and departure METAR. So examples of what you can do. Turn on the visual map of METARs. Almost all apps have this where instead of just reading airport by airport text weather reports, you can get a graphical representation of the METARs. Those are the green dots, the blue dots, the red dots. That helps you get a big picture overview of the conditions you're looking at. Is it just uh, one isolated airport down in the river valley with some fog, or is it really widespread IFR conditions? Uh, I think at a glance, you get tremendous value out of one of those visual maps. Pilot reports, another great part to add on. Maybe there's not a METAR where you care about the weather, but there's a pilot report. Somebody broke out and said bases are at 2,800 feet. That's very valuable. Satellite imagery, if you're on SiriusXM, can be very helpful, understanding how widespread clouds might be, and surface analysis, either as a pre-flight or in-flight with SiriusXM. Uh, not a real-time tool, maybe, but can reinforce the big picture. Again, where are the fronts, where are the lows? So start with that big picture and then fill in the specific METARs. Try to fit those METARs into the pattern. You could say, well, a cold front just came through and we've got some leftover scud, and so that's why these airports are showing marginal VFR rather than just reading them in a vacuum. Of course, you do have to read METARs. I'm not suggesting you skip those. Uh, so start visual, but then go down to the text. I do think it's important to be fluent in METARs. Most of these apps do a fantastic job of decoding the METARs and making them understandable in plain English. That's great. But it doesn't hurt to actually read the raw text once in a while. Uh, there can be some revealing things there. As you see in this example, we've got light snow and mist. Well, here's another example. You, I might look at this on an IFR day, and if I was just in a big hurry, I'd say, well, I'm landing at CVG, that's Cincinnati, and the wind's 360 at 10, that's no problem. Runway 36 is the most common runway there, that's easy. Three miles, light snow, mist, broken 600. Okay, so it's an IFR day. Uh, definitely not a picture perfect VFR day, but I'm instrument current, that's well above approach minimums of 200 and a half, so. 603 light snow, no problem, here we go. Well, if you dig a little bit deeper, some of that junk in line two that most of us don't know how to read actually involves some interesting stuff. So you can see, well, the temperature on the ground is below freezing, that may be a little bit of a warning. That means if we pick up ice or anything, we're not gonna shed it. Ooh, and then that whole FZDZ part, that means freezing drizzle ended a minute ago. Freezing drizzle's not good, especially if the temperature is below zero. No ice accumulation in the last hour, but there was ice, ice accumulation in the last six hours. So that is definitely important information. That to me puts this flight in another category of now I'm not just dealing with IFR conditions, I'm dealing with possible freezing drizzle, and possible icy runways. You don't have to necessarily have memorized all of these contractions. You can Google this stuff beforehand. Uh, I mostly bring this up as a reminder to go beyond just the ceiling and visibility. Sometimes the stuff that comes after the temperature dew point and altimeter can have some important details. So if the weather's marginal, go all the way and make sure you understand what that METAR is saying. Also a reminder that for VFR pilots, rain is not your friend. Uh, a lot of times you can look at a METAR and say, well, it's VFR, but if there's rain moving through or has recently moved through, you ought to have a little red flag go up because rain can create lots of problems for VFR pilot. Rain by itself can cut visibility. So especially if it's showery, you can go from 10 miles of visibility to three miles in an instant if there's lots of showers moving around. But they can also cause low level scud. You know, if you have a morning of rain 
and the temperature is right around the dew point, you can kind of have those wispy clouds at low level that are really caused by the rain. So be aware of those light scattered showers. Those can uh, cause problems even hours after they move through. Here's an example where the rain has moved off well to the northeast. It's long gone, but look at the crummy weather it's left behind. We've got 300 overcast mist in three miles. So again, look at all the weather products, not just the METAR. In this case, that radar is also a critical thing to look at. All right, so that's IFR conditions. Let's talk about thunderstorms. Probably the biggest one people think about when they think about data link weather. Uh, I kind of emphasize IFR conditions because I think a lot of people skip over that, honestly. And as the accident reports show, it is the number one issue. However, thunderstorms are no fun, especially in the summertime, can ruin a lot of good cross-country trips. So uh, data link weather is a great resource for that. But I think pilots sometimes get too simplistic about it. So here's an example. I'll show this picture here. This is a ADSB weather picture from a flight I took a few years ago. Would you fly through that? The only correct answer is, I don't know. Sure, there's some yellow, even a little bit of orange, but you don't know by simply looking at that radar picture. You need more information. You need to know that big picture. That's because of what we're really trying to answer is, is this convective? Remember what radar shows. Radar shows water. It shows precipitation. So that yellow stuff could just be a stable stratus layer with rain. You might even be on top of it. It might be perfectly harmless. Or it could be a building thunderstorm, a bouncy ride, and a really bad day. It's not enough to know it's yellow. You need to know, is it convective? So some ways to do that, to go just beyond looking at uh, the basic radar picture. I remember this with SIGH, SI. Uh, it happens to fit the words, but it's also what I end up doing when I see images like this a lot of times. You say, ah, what do we do now? First of all, S is for shape. Uh, and this is basically, am I look, do I have any bows or hooks or really nasty looking shapes? Uh, you know, a blob of generic rain, like you see on the right, looks different from a fast moving cold front, like you see on the left. That does tell you something about the weather that's around that radar return. So on the left there, that's a fast moving uh, line. Uh, I'm not going to touch that. On the right, that's really just rain. And I flew through that, actually was on top of a lot of it. And there was uh, no turbulence at all, just light rain. All right, the I, that's for intensity. That's what we all think of. That's color. Uh, you know, pink is bad, red is pretty bad, yellow is meh, maybe, and green could be okay. We all know that one. G, I think, is maybe the most important other than color, and that's gradient, which is how fast does it go from green to red? So again, on the right, we have this very shallow gradient, mostly green, and then it gets to dark green, and then a little bit of yellow, and maybe a tiny bit of orange, but it's a very shallow gradient. Whereas the picture on the left, we go from nothing to purple in the span of about 10 miles. That's an extremely steep gradient. So that tells me on the left, this is a very serious thunderstorm. You're not gonna go through that in anything. Whereas on the right, it's probably just rain. And then the H is height or the echo tops. So if you have Sirius XM, that's where that tool comes in I showed earlier, the orange arrows. If you have tops at 60,000 feet, that's a whole different animal from tops at 20,000 feet. 60,000 feet, that means you've got a booming cumulonimbus cloud. You've got updrafts and downdrafts. You've got bad news there. So any one of those on their own is interesting, but you put all four together and you can really make a better diagnosis. That's Most of you probably look at the picture there and say, well, left is bad, right is better. But think about why you say that. And it's pretty much a mix of those four things. It's not just the color, but it's also the shape of it, the gradient. On the topic of color, uh, it's worth pointing out that it's not 100% standardized. Uh, there are, depending on the source of your radar, it can be green and yellow at different levels. You can see, for example, Sirius XM goes yellow at 35 decibels of reflectivity, whereas ADS-B goes yellow at 40. This is not a big deal. You know, red is still red, uh, but it's worth understanding there are differences. One way, if you want to try to normalize that, is to use the four-color radar option in ForeFlight. This standardizes everything at sort of an industry standard scale where 30 dBZ becomes yellow, 40 becomes red, 50 becomes uh, pink or magenta. I don't fly with that all the time. I find, um, I find four color radar tends to overstate things a little bit, but it's a handy thing to toggle back and forth to kind of give a reality check. Uh, it, it can make sure you're not being too, uh, too uh, liberal with how you look at some of these radar images. So here's one on a trip. 
Uh, you can see mostly green on the right, a whole lot of red on the left. Again, based on my experience flying through that, I thought that red and yellow was a little bit overstated, but certainly doesn't hurt to be uh, on the safe side. So this is a feature you should at least know how to look at and uh, experiment with it. See what you find in your flying. A lot of weather flying is calibrating your eye out the window to what you see on the screen. So other than SI, other things to look at when we're avoiding thunderstorms is confirming evidence. So it's, again, use all the tools. This is rule number four. Uh, don't just look at the radar. Look at lightning. This is available both on ADS-B and Sirius XM. Look at pilot reports. Look at METARs. I'm surprised how often pilots skip over this. Is that a thunderstorm? Well, there's an airport right underneath. What's it saying? Does it say heavy rain and thunderstorm uh, or cloud tops? So again, find that supporting evidence. Here's an example on the right. We've got everything you would need to call it a thunderstorm. It's pink. It's a steep gradient going from nothing to pink in almost no time. Uh, and it's got lightning symbols over top of it. So I'm confident that's a thunderstorm. One helpful feature in a lot of these apps when you're flying around thunderstorms is the ruler tool. This is where you can tap two fingers on the map and see how far you have between cells. This is good for an overview of planning. I use this all the time, but my caution here is to not get too uh, explicit about it. You should not be using this again for tactical deviation to say, ooh, I've got five and a half miles between there so I can shoot the gap. It's really not meant for that. It's more of a long range. How far apart are those? A lot or a little? That's what that ruler is good for. All right, the final threat is icing. And again, we're gonna start with the big picture. The big picture here includes a lot of things before you ever even take off. Where are you flying? You can see this chart from NASA. Uh, icing conditions happen in the Pacific Northwest, the Great Lakes, and New England. If you're in Arizona, not saying you can't get ice, but it's a whole lot less uh, likely. So start with that big picture. Then think about the air mass you're flying in. Are we talking about dry clouds, or wet clouds? Where's the low? Generally, east of a low is where the worst icing is. You've got some moist air kind of being sucked up into the, the low, and you can, get, uh, you can get some pretty ugly icing there. Also think about, is there a temperature inversion where we have warmer air aloft and colder air below? That could lead to freezing rain where you have cold precipitation uh, falling through warmer air. It can melt. It can refreeze. So again, think about the big picture of what you're flying in. And then move on to some forecasts. We are really lucky. The latest icing forecasts are excellent. Uh, certainly have come a long way over the last 10 or 15 years. These are available in most apps. Here you see ForeFlight. Uh, before takeoff, there's actually two icing forecasts. One is US and one is called Global. US is based on the short range wrap model. It updates every hour going out to 18 hours and is higher resolution. The Global one's based on the GFS model. It goes out 24 hours, but it's only updated four times a day and is lower resolution. So I generally prefer to use the US one for this. And that's telling you basically what you see there. W what is the severity of icing I'm gonna get? Uh, the darker it gets, the worse it is. And you can use the slider bar on the right of the screen to see different altitudes. A lot of times when we talk about icing, altitude is the key part. Where are the bases of the clouds? Where are the tops? Where is the worst icing? Can I stay below it? Can I get on top of it? That's what this tool is great for. Combination of the altitude slider and the time slider, you can forecast different scenarios of different altitudes at different times and what are my options. That's really what you should be doing here. This is not an absolute forecast that at that exact point in time, you will have exactly this much icing. It's a way for you to compare different options. If I leave later, if I go higher, what does that look like? In flight, we have access to uh, a couple of helpful features when it comes to icing, both the icing forecast layer and cloud tops. Uh, these are available on both ADS-B and Sirius XM. A couple points to on this, to this minor differences. Um, the icing forecast layer, again, it is a forecast, and it is every 2,000 feet from 2,000 to 24,000 feet. This shows probability, not severity. Real minor point, but the, the forecast most of the time you look at is for severity. That is, is this light or moderate or heavy icing? What you're looking at here is probability. How likely is it that I will get icing? Uh, then the cloud tops tool, as I mentioned, clouds are so key with icing, especially in piston airplanes. That's the picture you see on the right. This is for flight with the cloud tops ADS-B layer turned on. And this is uh, the same idea. You've got a slider bar on the right for altitude. And this basically shows where do the clouds end. So you can take that slider and run it up and down and see how there's 
full overcast at 12,000 feet, but by 15,000 feet, all the clouds have disappeared. So you know the tops are somewhere around there. I think this is really helpful for a big picture view. But again, this is not for tactical use. This, this is a forecast product. It's not accurate enough to tell you within 500 feet uh, where exactly the cloud tops are. So you should not be using this for, for that level of detail. You should be using it at the level of uh, where are the tops really high and where are they really low? And can I change my altitude or my route to take advantage of that and stay out of the ice? Pilot reports are the last one. Very important for all kinds of weather, but I think icing probably most importantly. Pilot reports are great. You should look for them. You should ask ATC for them if you don't see them. And you should give them. Be a good, uh, a good member of the pilot community and share your PI reps. Uh, especially if you don't get ice. A lot of pilots report when they get ice, but sometimes a negative PI rep can be as valuable as a PI rep of icing conditions. So if you're cruising along at 8,000 on top and you're not getting ice, let somebody know. That might help the next pilot make their plan and be confident. One thing I'd like to point out with PyReps, though, is that this is uh, sort of an editorial uh, product. This is not a black and white, yes, no kind of thing. Uh, it depends on the airplane. So don't just look at the symbol on the map. Tap on the, each individual PyRep that might be of value to you and make sure you read it. There's a difference between a 767 descending at 300 knots and a 172 climbing at 70 knots. What moderate icing is or what moderate turbulence is can be very different for both those airplanes in those different regimes. So make sure you understand that. And also look for the commentary. Uh, you know, one pilot's light is another pilot's moderate. Sometimes people will joke. But in this case, you can see the screen here. We've got the comments after the pilot report. And this is a citation pilot reporting some icing that sounds really, really bad, no matter what you're flying. So, oh boy, is it really moderate? Well, based on that pilot's comment, yes, that's bad. So I, I find sometimes those, uh, those comments at the end are as valuable as the rest of it. Make sure you're tapping on the icon to read all that. Also, finally, remember a lack of icing pie reps does not mean a lack of icing. Sometimes the weather's so bad that nobody's flying. So just because there are no pie reps for icing doesn't mean there's no icing. That's where you'd want to back it up by looking at the icing forecast, look at the cloud tops, look at that big picture, make sure you understand all the different features that might go into the weather situation for the day. All right, there's the theory and the application. Let's look at it in the real world. Here are five scenarios from my personal flying over the years where I've learned something about data link weather. Not all of them are great. <laughs> Here's scenario one. Uh, this was a flight from Cincinnati out to Las Vegas. I think we we're going to the NBAA show four or five years ago and uh, woke up and the radar looked like this with three separate lines of looked like storms out there. And you talk about sighing, I definitely sighed at this. I thought, oh my gosh, we got all day to fly and look at this mess of a weather. I didn't really feel like flying through any of that stuff. So honestly, my first answer was, well, we're just gonna cancel, this trip's not gonna work. And sure, that would have been a fair answer. But I kind of caught myself, I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm not exactly walking the walk here. The goal is to get from Cincinnati to Las Vegas. There are no bonus points for going direct. I have all day to do it. Uh, I have data link weather. So the answer is get creative on routing. And so this is an example to me where you just have to take what mother nature gives you. And in this case, mother nature was not giving us direct. So we went well north, almost due north on takeoff and basically just went around the weather. We weren't gonna try to pick through the weather. We went around it. And yes, did that add some time? It sure did. But at the end of the day, it didn't add that much. We made it to our destination. We had a pretty smooth flight. We weren't even in the clouds for most of it. It's just a much better way to do it. So my, my lesson from this one is go around the weather. Resist the temptation to try to pick through it or save four minutes by cutting the corner. Use that big picture overview and just move the route until you are clear of the weather. We did it on this day, even on a long, long flight, uh, and it worked out fine. So take what Mother Nature gives you. I skipped this slide because this is kind of a bonus here, but when in when you have the option, try to fly around the upwind side uh, of weather like that. So if the in this case, the weather is moving southeast, well, you could try to race it to the airport on the east side, but you're doing exactly that. You're racing the weather. Better option is to swing around the backside uh, and let it move out so you're coming in behind it. You don't always have that option, but if you do, that's, a, that's generally a safer way 
first of all, you're not racing it. Second of all, if there is any hail blowing off the top of one of those, it'll usually be blowing out downwind. And so you're a little bit safer going around the backside. All right, scenario two. This is not as organized a day. This is more of what I call popcorn. It's the southeast on a hot summer day. And after about two o'clock, all the cumulus starts to build and some of them turn into thunderstorms. So pop-up storms all around. But none of these are really giant organized lines. They're mostly just the air mass storms. So the plan today is stay visual and miss the clouds. Even though I was IFR, on an IFR flight plan talking ATC, I was not gonna go flying through clouds. We we're gonna stay visual and deviate. So in this case, the eyes are really our primary weather tool, but Datalink weather is backing us up and informing those decisions, telling us which way to deviate, what's on the other side of that cloud. So this is what the day looks like. This may look familiar to any of you who fly a lot in the summertime. Not bad weather, in fact, outside the clouds, visibility is fantastic, but you don't wanna fly through any of those puffies. Uh, you know, that one right there probably isn't gonna hurt you, but you'll get a good little bump going through there. So this is a day just to bob and weave and miss all of those clouds. And we use data link weather to let us know what's on the other side. So we had a great flight home, made it back, uh, you know, lo logged 0.0, .0 of IMC time because we stayed out of all those clouds. And data link weather just gave us the confidence to always know we had an out. So we knew that around that next cloud, there was not a giant a lurking cell of thunderstorms. We always had an out. We knew which way to go if we decided we didn't like things. And we could bail out to the west and find an airport. So that's where data link weather really plays a great supporting role to give us that strategic view of the weather situation so we know uh, that we are not ever out of options. No blind alleys when you're doing this kind of flying. So the lesson here, fly the trip as a series of short flights. That's basically what I did. Um, you know, is it convective? Yes, it was convective, that stuff. So we're gonna miss as much of it as possible. We're gonna stay visual. And we basically flew airport to airport. All right, we see a clear path for the next 75 miles. We know we have a, a, an out at that airport. Let's bob and weave visually, get to that airport, see how things look there. We have another path, we'll keep going. Uh, if at any point you don't like what you see ahead, you have an out, you land there and either wait for it to pass or wait till the next morning. That's really how you need to fly, I think, in, in summertime when you're dealing with weather like this, is just break it up into a series of shorter trips. Scenario three, whole different story. This is a winter flight, and this is not popcorn, but a mess of rain, uh, clouds, wind, just kind of an ugly winter day, trying to come home from Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and as bad as the screen looked in, in uh, four flight, I really wasn't too worried about the rain because as you can see, it looks like mostly rain. Let's go back to that radar part. It's mostly green with just a little bit of yellow. The gradient is extremely shallow. Uh, there's the tops, you know, the, the echo tops seem to be pretty low. There's no ugly shape. So this looks like just rain to me. This doesn't look like it's convective, but it's winter time. So I'm really worried about icing. Uh, and I see what looks like some pilot reports. I see some blue pilot reports on the screen there. That's what I'm thinking about. So we got to go beyond the radar. I pull up the satellite imagery to get a sense of where are the clouds. Uh, I look at the icing forecast chart and the PIREPS, and I start playing scenarios here. How about at this altitude? How about at that altitude? What does it look like there? What do the PIREPS say compared to the icing forecast? Do the PIREPS back up the forecast? How about METARs? Do I have an out? Think back to that METAR we showed earlier at CBG. If it's below freezing on the ground, I don't really have an out. So what I'm looking for here is a place with good VFR weather and ideally a temperature on the ground above freezing. Uh, again, we're using all the tools to make sure we have a full picture and make sure we have options. So I had reasons for optimism, which is why I took off. Yes, a lot of rain. Yes, a lot of icing forecasts and pyreps, but all of them were above 12,000 feet. There was no forecast icing and no pyreps for icing below 12,000 feet. Lots of rain, but all green and a shallow gradient and high ceilings. I started poking around some of the METARs and, and while there was tons of rain, and in this case, my destination was reporting light rain, 10 miles visibility and 9,500 foot ceilings underneath. So forget the radar, it's a VFR day down there. Uh, so I launched and it worked out just fine. This is an example to me of using all the information. You could easily look at that first picture in ForeFlight and say, yuck, green stuff everywhere I'm not flying, but it ended up being a VFR day below 12,000 feet. So uh, absolutely flyable in a whole bunch of different airplanes. 
Just have to use all the products to make sure you understand what's really going on. Scenario four, this one I'm low level, uh, I'm in a helicopter, so IFR is not an option, and I'm not realistically getting above maybe 2,000 feet. It's just no use in taking a helicopter to 11,000 feet. So this is this is a low and slow cross-country flight, and the re weather really doesn't look too bad. There's a couple of tiny little blobs of rain, but I mean, they're barely even green, and uh, I'm in a hurry to get home, and so I'm poking around, and oh, okay, London 6,500 overcast, well, that's incredibly great weather for a helicopter. That's really high. Uh, and that one little green dot down there in the rain, still 3,600 foot ceiling. So obviously no problem. Off we go. Fired up, took off. Well, I forgot we were taking off out of the mountains in East Tennessee. And yeah, there wasn't heavy rain, but all that rain had kicked up some scud. This is what I was talking about earlier. Uh, in the mountains, there was all this kind of scud hanging off the mountaintops. Not a great view for a VFR pilot. So the mistake I had made here, and there are many mistakes uh, I probably made here. One was rushing, uh, but another key one I made was over-interpolating. I looked at two METAR reports. They were both VFR, and I assumed it must be fine in between. Well, it doesn't guaranteed to be fine in between. <laughs> Remember the big picture here, and I had not looked at the big picture, and there was a little bit of a low-pressure system that was just kind of keeping things stirred up just enough. So there's weather happens between airports. Uh, and a lot of times you can fall into that trap of saying, I looked at all the METARs along my route of flight, they were all fine. Is go beyond site METARs. Use all those uh, map layers, use all the information, make sure you understand the big picture. Don't just look at radar and METARs and blast off. That is how you get into trouble. And that is exactly what I did. Uh, that caused a problem. All right, last scenario here. Uh, this is a, an old one, but boy, I learned this one uh, firmly in this case. I was flying back to Cincinnati from the West Coast. Uh, been a long trip, long day of flying, and we were kind of trying to avoid this big line of, of weather. You could see really ugly stuff. Uh, purple, sharp gradient, that's ugly. We're not going through that, that's for sure. But it looked like we were gonna get lucky and be able to come just around the north side of it, sneak into our destination and life was good. So we were really optimistic. We got closer and it looked like there was some stuff starting to pop up, but still a huge gap on radar, right? So no problem, off we go. Well, unfortunately that was the gap. And that's the picture out the window of the airplane. You can see, you can see through it, you can see blue, and I'm sure some pilots would probably try to shoot that gap, but not me. Uh, that looked like a sucker hole to me. And so we did not take that. Uh, we went around, added five minutes, and went around the north side of it. And this just is a reinforcement of that final rule that your eyes get a veto. Uh, yes, the, the iPad showed a nice, beautiful gap there in the radar, but that is not a gap we were gonna fly. The view out the window was ugly, so it was not gonna happen for us. And that's a, that's a great lesson in remembering the ultimate weather decider is the pilot, and sometimes the best real-time weather tool is your eyes. Uh, and don't let that radar talk into a bad decision. One quick bonus here on these that I've learned over the years is it's not all bad news. Uh, you can use uh, data link weather and all the tools and your eyes to actually fly more trips. I'm not suggesting you blast off in terrible weather and do something unsafe, but I do think the smart use of data link weather not only keeps you safer, but can help you fly more flights. So here's an example of uh, a flight home, and I look at it and say, oh gosh, uh, you know, ugly radar, right? I mean, just multiple lines, nasty, nasty stuff, but I'm falling into the same trap. I'm just looking at radar and making an assumption. Uh, actually, this trip ended up being fine. Know the big picture. Most of this was pop-up stuff. Use your eyes, use all the different weather products. And we made we made this flight no problem. It was widely scattered stuff. Uh, we deviated an awful lot, but we never got inside of a cloud. And this was a, an example to me of, of a trip that I never would have done without data link weather. If it was the old days and I was having to talk to flight watch or watch my ADF needle swing, I would not have made this flight. I would have landed short. But with data link weather and all the tools combined with my eyes, we made the trip no problem. So to review, I, I view this sort of like a funnel. Uh, we start the weather decision-making process with the big picture knowledge, understanding the, the fronts, the lows, what's driving the local weather. 
Then we go to data link for confirming evidence. We look at radar, METARs, TAFs, pilot reports, all those products we talked about, and then you confirm it with your eyes, and that's the ultimate veto power. And it's on you as a pilot in command then to use that data to make the decision. Remember, none of those things in themselves are making the decision you are. I like to close with this quote, uh, Richard Collins, great aviation writer, great pilot I had the privilege of working with for many years. He wrote this, nobody gets trapped by weather. There are always signs. And when I first heard him say this, I kind of chuckled and said, well, yeah, well, you're Richard Collins. Of course, that's true. But for us normal people, I'm not so sure about that. Sometimes you get trapped. As the years have gone by, I've kind of come to agree with him, though. Uh, not surprising. Dick Collins knew a lot. And the point is, there are almost always signs. You just have to know where to look. You have to be curious enough to keep looking for them. Don't take the first METAR report that satisfies what you want and move on. Make sure you're looking for all those signs. I want to mention iPad Pilot News in closing here. This is a free website we do at Sporties. It has a ton of great information about this topic. We do how-to articles, ADSB receiver products, tips and tricks. It's all free. There's a bi-weekly email newsletter. If you haven't read iPad Pilot News, I'd suggest you do that. It's a great place to really brush up on not just your knowledge of iPad apps like ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot, but also some of this uh, weather flying stuff. And we'll have a recording of this webinar on that site, for example.